Hello, Hambini fans, and welcome. In today's episode, we have another bicycle frame and another problem. This week's frame is this Cervelo. It's an R2, part of their lightweight bike range, and it has been sent to me by a chap from Finland who had a problem with his bottom bracket. And this video will document how we go about fixing this problem. Now, the issues affecting this frame are not isolated purely to the R2 model. Uh, I've had a few of these frames with very similar issues, uh, but I just haven't made videos about them. Um, this is the first frame where I've done that, but this affects the R2, the R3, the R5, the S3 and the S5. Now before I bore your bollocks off by going on about technical details of a highly sophisticated nerd-like nature, I thought I'd give you a brief history of Cervelo perhaps and the frame in particular. So Cervelo is a Canadian company, they were formed sometime in the early 90s by two people called Phil White and Gerard, but I think he's pronounced Herard because he's Dutch, if you're Dutch please correct me, Vrooman. Now uh, they both sold out because they wanted the money and they left this to a load of, um, what's they called, what are they called, investment wankers, bankers. Um, and this is the, the net result. Now this particular frame was bought from Sigma Cycles who are a fairly large bicycle dealer in the UK, was sent to Finland, um, a chap bought one of my bottom brackets, tried to fit it, it did go in, but he had a few problems with it. Um, diagnosing these kind of problems over email is not always straightforward, so there's a bit of umming and ahhing, toing and froing, and I sent another bottom bracket out, still similar problems, and then more bearing failures and a few other bits and pieces. In the end, I, um, I paid for the guy to send the frame back to me so I could check it, because there was a few things that I wasn't sure about, and that's where we are now. So what I'm going to do now is show you some of the bits that came with it and just a brief overview of this frame. So he sent me the frame, um, the second bottom bracket, bearings and the original bottom bracket which he actually hacksawed in half to use as a press for one of his other bikes. So that is effectively uh, scrap, can't really do much about that. But the bearings and the old bottom bracket do hold some details. So this bottom bracket, I've checked this and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the bearings, just initially to the touch, when you spin them round, you can feel what it feels like it's uh, running on gravel um, when you apply load, which suggests it's had a bit of an overload condition or that it's crushed. Um, that one doesn't feel too bad, so I'm suspecting this one is the one that was in the frame and this one was the one that wasn't in the frame. What I mean by that is the B bright bottom brackets are um, asymmetrical. So this part here doesn't actually go in the frame, but that part does. So uh, if we look at the bike frame, I'll put this tape there just to cover the serial number of the um, bicycle. Uh, if I tip this up. What we've got is the frame, and on this side, the center line runs through about there. The bike bottom bracket sits like that. So, I don't know if that can, you can just about see it, but the, on the drive side, this flange sticks out from the frame. On the non-drive side, it's flush with the frame. To illustrate that bit a bit better, I've shown you, well this is my um, Cervelo S5 that uses the same type of B-Bright bottom bracket. On the non-drive side, it's completely flush with the frame. However, if we turn over and go to the drive side, hopefully you can just about see the flange that sticks out. It is here, right there. So that is sticking out 11 millimeters from the bike frame. I had the frame checked um, and the NDT technician said there was a void around where the C in the Cervelo is. Again, another void over here where the um, L is and then a couple of voids in the top tube. In his opinion, he didn't think it was that bad um, and he would let it go. Uh, overall, when you look at this frame, it's not too bad, but there's like certain things like in this area 
you can see bits of you know, it looks like plastic or some of the forming agents and things like that uh, that don't look too good. Uh, and then another bit around here where the cable comes out, that hole doesn't look great. Um, but that's really minor. The only thing that I won't be particularly happy about is the finish inside the headset. Uh, a bit further down, it's it's like a step, almost as though it hasn't come out the mould properly and it's a bit ribbed. Um, but again, I'll probably let that go. As far as the bottom bracket goes, I'm going to zoom in to the bottom bracket. This is the drive side of the bottom bracket. Um, it's clearly visible that this bottom bracket, even before measuring, is oval. Um, the bottom bracket that I've just taken out, that the customer sent back, is round. I've checked that. This has like witness marks that are very deep on one side and then they effectively decay to nothing on the other. Uh, and they all are also deeper going into the bottom bracket, which visually suggests that the bottom bracket is tapered. Now on the other side of the bike frame, so this is the non-drive side of the bike frame, there are no marks whatsoever um, say for a, a few little burrs on the outside. Uh, so that tells me the bottom bracket is slightly wider on this side than it is the other. Now I've got the vernier out to show you. I've checked this with a micrometer, um, but the uh, diameter of the, the drive side is 45.89. Uh, we'll come on to the spec specification of B-Bright in a minute, but uh, that's quite um, quite worrying really. So I've gone through some of the foibles of this frame. Um, it's okay, it's not brilliant, but really what I need to show you is some of the technical shenanigans that goes along with this, plus the scan results and a bit more data. So we'll go inside and go to my computer. So as is the norm, I have made some slides. Now, I wasn't quite sure what to call this presentation, so I decided to call it this which is, let me turn my pointer on. Cervelo, engineering by fucktard, and that's me being charitable. Um, and someone complained that they didn't like my by Hambini aged five sticker. So here it is, because I'm not gonna stand for that kind of bullshit. Right, I'll just briefly jump through the history of Cervelo. They were founded by these two gentlemen circa 1995. Canadian brand headquarters are in Toronto. Uh, I think they're still there. Um, they market themselves as a premium brand, so they sponsor some fairly big cycling teams. They used to sponsor Dimension Data or supply bikes to them. Uh, I think they supply somewhere right now. Now they are owned by PON Holdings, PON Holdings. So uh, PON Holdings also own Rally, Focus, Ghost, and a few others. Their bike range really consists of R, S and P. So R is a lightweight bike, so this Cervelo R2 is a lightweight range, S or climbing bike, S is the aerodynamic road bike, and P is triathlon based bike, TT bike. And even I am a donut, because I bought one, um, which I won't say I regret it, but yeah, that's where we are. Right, part of the diagnosis of any of these problems is looking at the history of what happened. So the chap who owns this frame, he bought the frame from, uh, bought the bike from Sigma. So they are a UK retailer, a fairly big one. Uh, it wasn't a cheap frame, I think. Well, I Googled it and it said the price was around 3,000 quid, um, dollars or euros. It's not exactly cheap. He installed, well, he bought a Hambini BB, installed it and he said it was tight. Um, now the thing with the word tight is it's a relative term so your idea of tight and my idea of tight might be two different things so it's a bit a bit dubious there so he went and took the frame and the bottom bracket to a local technical college and did some more measurements there and fed that back to me and I made him a new bottom bracket um, with a modified install procedure still tight at this point the wasn't quite sure what was going on because what he was telling me, what I was supplying, that loop wasn't working how I anticipated. So the bearings were changed shortly afterwards and they were okay and then they became problematic. 
So I got a bit pissed off and then asked the customer if I could pay to have his frame sent to me for some checks. Uh, that was the best way because umming and ahhing and fanning around really pissing me off. Got the frame back. You've seen me uh, dismantle, well, have a look around it and do some initial measurements. Uh, it was also NDT checked, so that's non-destructively tested. Uh, there were no external cracks or defects. There were some voids. So the NDT chap uh, said there were a few voids. I've highlighted where they were, but nothing really too much to worry about. Measurement summary. So if I go to the drawing, let me go to the drawing uh, window. This is this is actually one of my bottom bracket drawings that I've um, annotated. So this is the non-drive side. This is the drive side, um, and these are the measurements in between. So there's a significant taper. So it goes from 45.97 down to 45.82. This is the best part of 0.2 of a millimetre and, um, and 0.14 millimetres on that side. So there's a taper there and an out of concentricity or eccentricity of 0.15 millimetres. This is a, this number is beyond Cervelo's um, uh, tolerance, but it depends on how you measure it um, because I could write that another way and it would be below their tolerance it's not clear what happens when you have angular misalignment as well but that's by the by right let me play the um powerpoint back so what i've done here is so the misalignment between the halves is 0.15 and i've just said it depends on how you measure it because you could be down at like 0.08 because of the angular misalignment and I've just taken the biggest number there. Um, there's uh, so that was parallel misalignment. The previous one. There's angular misalignment. Massive tapers on both sides, um, and the bottom bracket hole on either end is like a squashed oval. So it's not like an ellipse. It's it's uh, like a circle where one end has become blunt, um, and it's worse than the Tifosi frame. So to first frame that was on a few weeks ago, this that is like golden boy compared to this. This is this is just the epitome of shite. Terrible. What I've drawn here is I've drawn a schematic. Now it is exaggerated, but you'll get the gist. So this is the bottom bracket uh, opening. We've got drive side. You can see the two tapers and these two lines. These two lines are center lines and the reason why there is um, two of them that are offset is because that's the parallel misalignment. So one bearing, let's call it, is sitting slightly low of the other one. You could say slightly low or forward, backward, but it's, it's literally like that. You've also got some angular misalignment, so, and that's what this depicts on the non-drive side. Um, and that was the, the 0.08 millimeters. So angular misalignment is like that. Ovality or epsi, eps, ellipsoid oilality. Oh, I don't know the word, right? Um, and we've got tapers and the tapers are the thing that really hurts us on this frame. That, that causes all sorts of bearing problems. Um, now, one of the things I wanted to highlight is the pitfalls of remote measuring or remote anything. And I alluded to this earlier, there was a discrepancy between what I supplied, what the customer fed back, uh, and then what was resupplied, and then what the customer fed back again. So that, that feedback loop wasn't quite right. Uh, the, the main issue around there is having um, measurements that are not uniform uh, so i don't i don't you know slate the customer at all he's done the right thing so he's gone off and got it measured the first thing that happened was because i'm dyslexic i have some i suffer from something called well i won't say suffer it's probably not a technical term but dyslexic anxiety so i know i'm dyslexic so i can make these multiple errors over and over again and just cannot see it until someone shows me that i've made the error and that is a weakness that I have, but I recognize it. 
Now, the customer took the frame to um, his local technical college and used this Tessa three-point ball gauge to measure the inside of his bike frame and also measured the outside of the bottom brackets. But the issue with these three-point ball gauges is they're not very good at picking up um, ellipsoidal holes, so the blunt circles. They don't show up very well compared to a two-point micrometer or two-point ball gauge. Um, and they all are also not great when you want to pick up a taper unless it's well, it's a short taper. And that's the thing that, that killed it, really. Um, so unsurprisingly, the measurements were off. Um, but, you know, we are where we are. Now I'll give you a bit of an overview of B-Bright, BB right. Uh, nominally it is 79mm wide, 46mm in diameter. Used predominantly by Cervelo and Factor. A lot of people call it a stretch PF30 but it is subtly different. It has an asymmetric design, so 45mm of the frame on the non-drive side and 35mm on the drive side exist. Uh, axle crank clearance can be an issue and chain line can be problematic and if you've got one of these power meters which has a little bulge on the crank arm they can touch on the chain stays. So this is a drawing of what B-Bright looks like so the thing to note here is this side is the non-drive side of the bike frame and this side is the drive side. On the non-drive side the bottom bracket extends all the way to the end so you have nothing sticking out, it's completely flush. On the drive side there's 11 millimeters poking out uh, to give you chain ring some clearance. PF30 in a Shimano application or a um, 92 mil axle application has 11 millimeters sticking out both sides so you don't have these chain stay problems uh, to zoom in so we've zoomed in on B bright there zoomed in on PF30 there you can see this is completely flush on this one and you've got this nice big overhang on this one the reason why Cervelo have done this is to make it as stiff as they could this uh, set up you've got the bearing effectively in the same position but no frame material around it um, for most people it's not going to really make a difference whether you go B bright or PF30 now we got to this stage and I went to look up you know some data about B bright and then I came across this page and it was a page on the bike rumor website and a chap called Jordy Yordy he wrote in and said, recently Cervelo has increased their official tolerances from their BB up by 0.1 millimeters, um, 45.88 to 45.96 versus the previous 45.96 to 45.98. Um, and that is a massive tolerance. So I, I wasn't sure if you know this was some sort of wind up. So I went looking for the, um, the drawings and sure enough, he was right. So the drawing on the left, 45.98 to 45.96 and then the drawing on the right 45.88 to 45.96 so that is a difference of 0.1 millimeters and that is a huge difference massive um, and you can't realistically make a bearing operate in such a wide range you just can't do it so but rather than take my opinion for it I went and asked NTN and uh, they were quite blunt and they said the bore tolerances set by the supplier, which is Cervelo, were beyond the limit of their bearings and they would have no bearing clearance left. I also asked a small company called SKF and they gave me a bit more info and they recommended an M7 or N7 fit. That's basically 0.03 millimeters of interference. 0.13 is excessive and they went so far as to say they would not warranty their bearings in any Cervelo bike frame. Uh, they would have um, binding problems or have premature failure. So fairly strong words from fairly large engineering companies there. Uh, the performance implications. 
so you would have an utterly shite spin test now the chap did send me a video of his spin test and uh, I've managed to lose it somewhere so I can't show you but it was terrible uh, you would have a reduction in L10 life so L10 life is the standard way of calculating bearing life and you would end up on 20% of the rated life so an 80% reduction power loss in this particular scenario will be 11 watts at 50 kilometers per hour obviously that is theoretical but that's the bo bottom line 11 watts if you were to be a bit more realistic i think think well ntn said it'd be near 15 because it was that bad and a couple with that you get rapid bearing failure so my view, or the general engineering view of Cervelo, um, the manufacturing and engineering in this is appalling. And I don't use that word willy-nilly. It is really, really bad. It's like getting a cowboy in to do your double glazing or lay your drive. It's really, really bad. All of those aero gains that they go on about, 10 watts here, 5 watts there, you could, well, you will lose them all just in the crap manufacturing. Um, the behaviour is ridiculous because they've clearly made their tolerances wider so they don't have to warranty as many bike frames and they've put the onus onto the bike bottom bracket manufacturer who has to make a bottom bracket work in this you know ridiculous range you've got a better chance of pinning diarrhea to a wall than than being able to make a bottom bracket to work in this in this range um and they're penny pinching i mean they could set a decent tolerance and then employ some decent people to make their bike frames but they choose not to i've already mentioned this before you're going to get a rapid bearing failure now, one of the things that I have in my organization is we take responsibility for our mistakes. Uh, I went looking to find out who was responsible for this and this chap's name came up, Damon Rinard Reinard. So he, here's a picture of him. I don't know who supplies these pictures to me, but anyway, here's, here's his picture. Um, he's got a nice haircut. Um, fairly aerodynamic head compared to mine uh, I think his idea of drag is is dressing up on a Saturday night as a woman but you now okay, character assassinations aside um, and now he is a respected member of the village idiot community so he posts on lots of forums and everyone goes oh Damon Renard I want to have your children blah blah blah, blah. yes yes you know he's a cult I have no respect for him because um, he he doesn't take any responsibility for any of his errors. Now, I've openly asked him multiple times, you know, what you're doing with your tolerances, and he stays completely silent. He doesn't, you know, comment at all. If you want to ask him, you know, how how many watts will I save on my brand new Cervelo bike or Cannondale bike, he'll tell you. But if you ask him about his manufacturing tolerances, stay silent. And that thing, that kind of behaviour, really pisses me off. Because in my organisation, if someone comes along and says, look, I've fucked up, and I do this regularly, I've fucked up. Um, yes, okay, someone's screwed up, but it's not the end of the world. We move on, and we don't, we don't really think about it. And we probably hold that person in a bit more respect for coming forward and saying, look, I screwed up. This guy, I don't think he's a stupid guy. He, he must know what's going on. Anyway, he's now the technical director at Cannondale. Um, he does not want to be accountable. Now, it is possible he could be totally stupid and this drawing with these ridiculous chances came in front of him and uh, he just approved it anyway. But I don't believe he is because I've questioned him directly and he chooses not to respond. Now, you've, you've got a human response to choosing or the choice not to respond and that's the way he's gone about it. He hasn't done what Wahoo have done where they had a problem with one of their um, turbo trainers and the guy came out on the internet and said, look, we've screwed up. <sighs> yeah, it hurts, but you know, I hold them with respect and engineers as a whole will hold them with respect. Now in engineering circles, this tolerance fiddling business is 
it a, a dim view is taken upon it so you can't set a tolerance which is unachievable it will be like trying to well pin diarrhea to a wall or trying to cut a block of wood to one thousandth one thousandth of a millimeter with a saw it's just not practical anyway we've digressed not digressed but we've spoken about this shag wanking disaster for long enough let's come to the fix so the frame is here and we need to fix it so there's a few key things we have to do we need to stop it from cracking because of this excessive taper but we need a decent fit and uh, need to deal with the irregularity of the hole now really a hambini bb will there's not really much of a problem for this type of bottom bracket um, again the ovality not a problem a misalignment 0.15 millimeters max not even gonna touch it so not really too worried about those but the taper is a bit of an issue now the fixed methods now the easiest way is you could use one of these screw together praxis type bottom brackets um, now, I have used one of these before and I thought my frame was going to break because you had to screw it in so tight and the other thing is they have an o-ring on one side so the it takes into account the frame irregularities with an o-ring uh, so it is inherently not stiff and you might still have some fairly erratic alignment um, one of the things in the UK is the government has a scheme called a cycle to work scheme where you can buy a bike tax free now a lot of my colleagues buy Cervelos, Cannondales, all of these things on um, the tax free scheme and then they have these bottom bracket problems where they creak like a bitch and they've narrowed it down to this guy called Damon Reinard, Reynard and they universally hate him and we all hate him because they use my ID sometimes to ask questions about his tolerances and he doesn't answer so he's collectively known as a fucktard and my colleagues would have immense happiness by having this fucktard urinate on me but that isn't going to happen that is just not going to happen there's no way I'm having this fuckwit urinate on me so Another way, another thing that you could do is um, you could put that BB in from the non-drive side, which is the oop, the way that BB Infinite do it. Um, but you will have problems with clearance for um, power meters and the chain line will be off. So it's not really the way I would want to do it could also use a bullet to tease the shell during the install so we'll come to this in a minute so that will fix your alignment and validity in one operation and this is the method that I've chosen so the bullet let me show you what the bullet looks like this is the bullet so it just basically acts like a guide and the reason for needing this is because on B bright the non-drive side is completely flush so there's no taper like there is on PF30 or even BB386 Evo because both of these have this taper which will alleviate the stress raises that you get so the bullet looks like this just a guide effectively with the tape on the end this is the drawing for it so it's got my tolerances on there feel free to use those tolerances in your bottom brackets I've obviously fiddled them for the purposes of this YouTube presentation but there we go uh, so that I mean so that's where we are so we just need to use that as a guide um, so if we go back to the PowerPoint done that so this is what pressing a B bright bottom bracket into a tapered frame looks like um, so you've got the blunt edge into the taper you get a massive stress razor there which is likely to crack it or deform the bottom bracket one or the other with the guide you end up with uh, a tickler so the tickler it distributes the stress over a larger area so it's less likely to crack and that's how that works tip bits 
Uh, now, if you are American, this should be spelt with a D, apparently. I'm not very proficient in the English language, but I'm reliably informed that in UK English it is pronounced or spelt tit, T-I-T, bit. Um, so we'll just cover some of the odd aspects that uh, come up in this solution. First thing is the choice of bearing. So by default, I'd usually get NTN, um, NTN or even NSK for this for this application. So NSK bearings, some of them are made on the same line as NTN, so they sh they share a production line. Um, for the body, modified install procedure. So you'd have the bearings at the end. Uh, I mean, you could put the bearings in between, but it just make the bullet construction a bit more difficult. And a racing spec body, because it's stiffer. The normal classic spec is not as stiff, so this, this really needs a racing spec, especially after all the faffing around. So the fit calculated with FEA, um, but you could just use a hoop stress calculation, and there's your hoop stress um, equation. Now in hoop, you would normally assume the carbon fiber epoxy strength, or the one that I assume to be 60 megapascals, um, so you work out the stresses from there, just in case you are interested. Now we come on to the most important slide of this entire presentation, which is this. The conscious shitbag scale of engineering footwittism, copyrighted by me, made in the dinner queue while I was waiting for fish and chips. On the right, the lick. That's quite good. The shiz, not as good. Not a shitbag. Uh, borderline shitbag, definite shitbag, conscious shitbag, and speck of shite on the age of humanity. So. The further left we go, the worse it becomes. On the very left, we have Flow Wheels. Now, if you're not familiar with who these guys are, they are two twins, Canadian brothers, and I will reiterate what I usually say. They're a bunch of liars, frauds, and they try and sell you wheels that are aerodynamically crap. Um, and then any of the data that I've questioned, they've subsequently removed. So take from that what you will. Uh, Tifosi, uh, they sent a bike frame. Well, they didn't send a bike frame in, but I got hold of one of their bike frames and apparently ripped a strip out of them. Now I did ring them up and spoke to a guy called Josh Lambert who promised the world and hasn't delivered anything. So they're there in country shitbag land. Cannondale, definite country shitbags. We don't even need to talk about them here. That's just giving them free advertising. Zip wheeled impulse. So if you want to be the victim of more engineering fraud, buy some of their wheels. Again, I bought some. There's a recurring theme song here, somehow. Uh, and this week's entry, da -da 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 -da! so hello. They are definitely in country shitbag territory. Now, you know, prattling around aside, when people deal with me, they get two sides of my personality. So they get the personality, which is me fucking around, fanning around, swearing, you know, just generally causing havoc and then you have the engineering side of me which is I would say pretty professional so if you need something doing I'm quite you know, clued up and you know put my heart into it if I if I assume that personality and talk about what what has just gone on the engineering genuinely in the Cervelo headquarters factory whatever you want to call it is really really bad now i wouldn't buy a current cervello frame because you are at the risk of having all sorts of problems and the aerodynamic gains that you think you're going to get you won't get because the bottom bracket will just take them out completely it's okay for me i've engineered i can engineer a way around this but for the average person and even an advanced bike shop isn't going to be able to do some of this stuff so based on that i'd go buy something else now some people have said what would you go and buy if you've got the money go and buy a look or a time they may not be the most aerodynamically the best things out there but the aero gain that you get for the average rider let's say they're going at 35 kilometers per hour is minuscule in difference compared to the other brands versus the mechanical difference that you'll gain from having this shit fit. Now, you, you could argue that if they were all really, really good, then the Cervelo would still be the fastest, but the fact is, they're not. So, um, aerodynamically, yeah, there is a difference, but 
mechanically that's where the, the big difference is now packing all that to one side let's go back and fix this fucking frame just before we fit the bottom bracket what we've got to do is we've got to take out some of these burrs that have been left behind i don't know if it's from the previous customer or from the customer or from the factory so i've got a bit of steel wool i'm just going to rub that round just to take them out i've also put a bit of um solvent on there just to give it a bit of lubricant but that's quite effective at taking the burrs out and we need to clean it all out Now what we need to do is we need to spray a bit of activator. Let it dry for five minutes. This is the bottom bracket that's going to go in uh, and this is one of the guides. This is the bullet that's going to go in to uh, guide it in. Now if you look carefully, hopefully you can just make out that this bit is tapered normally i would make these out of steel but i'd run out um so i've i've had to go for aluminium aluminium pressing with aluminium is not a really clever thing to do because it can gall which is effectively friction well in itself between two surfaces um so i wouldn't recommend you did that so to mitigate this i've put an o-ring in here uh to to stop the friction welding occurring all that does is that goes in there like that and then that acts as a guide now there is a slight taper on the bullet might not be apparent um, to the camera Let's see if I can zoom in hopefully you'll be able to see the taper but that that there is my vernier caliper and I'm going to use the straight section of that and you should be able to just about make out the taper on the right hand side it's only very slight um, about a millimeter so what we have here is one of my uh, press tools. This one I've had for a significant length of time, as you can tell. Uh, and the handles unscrew out, um, which out like that. Once they unscrew out, you're left with that. And that is fairly useful because you can use it as a press. And it's got a f flat um, sections on it. So we can use this to press this in. So use that and that as a guide. We'll assemble this up. So the bullet's already located. You can just about see that. Push that in. And then we screw down. All I've done here is I've just turned the bike over so you can see this a bit better, but you can see the bottom bracket going in.
The reason why I've stopped here is the bullet has touched my guide, so I need to take this off. So in order to do that, we just need to back this off a bit. Take the guy, uh, the press part off this side, which is just another bullet. What we need to do now is we need to apply a bit of thread, uh, not really thread lock, uh, retaining compound to the shell. Now the bullet has some very small slits in it to allow the retaining compound to go past it as we pull it out. On the other side, on the drive side, no problem, you can just apply thread lock, not thread lock, retaining compound at will. So I've just reassembled half the press. We turn the guide round the other way so that the bullet pushes through. Getting a bit stiff now because now this side's engaging as well. I'm going to stop there because it's there. Uh, hard up against the bottom bracket and it won't go around. So if we take this off, back this out. If I've done my calculations correctly, the bullet should have cleared and it has. It's just cleared the, uh, the frame and we should be able to pull that out. Like that. So that's the bullet's gone through. So we're at the point now where we're going to install some bearings. All I'm fitting is uh, NTN super precision bearings. So there's a P2 tolerance 6806 there and a 6806 there, both LLB seals. We're just going to push this in now. I can tell by the way that goes in that that is a very, very good fit. Spun the bike over so you can see the uh, the drive side. The bearing has gone in both sides. I'm just giving it a spin and it's really like butter. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to put a test crank in and then see how she spins. Now the chap is using a 30 mil axle, um, I think, but it doesn't really matter on a Hambini BB because it's modular. So we just put the uh, caps in, the Delrin top hat. Get the crank arm.
Now let's give it a spin. Jobs are good in. Now I did speak earlier about my reasoning for not trying to push and make a new bottom bracket and push it in from the non-drive side and the reason is pretty obvious now. On B bright you have very little clearance um, so you know that is probably uh, a much tighter clearance than most people would go for um, but that's the reality of what Cervelo has made their standard as. That's that's it's a perfect chain line um, but, and that's the clearance that you've got left behind so um, that's it really that is actually pretty good I'm pleased with that I thought that was going to be a right bitch to illustrate that in a bit more graphic detail this is a sheet of A4 paper 80 grams per square meter I folded it in half and it won't clear the gap between the uh, crank and the frame if I just use one shot side it'll just go through so that gap is 0.1 millimeters there or thereabouts this is the non-drive side of the bike and this is the bottom bracket installed so you can see there's there's absolutely no clearance between the frame and the bottom bracket is completely flush this is an inherent problem with uh, Cervelo bikes and the B bright standard because it leaves very very little clearance if you were to get something like a power meter uh, and then that would possibly touch the bottom bracket if it didn't sit flush they've just used all of the room all the way up to the very end and it's the only bottom bracket where that that um, problem occurs so that takes us to the end of this video i sincerely hope you enjoyed it in conclusion I would certainly recommend you buy a different brand, brand of bike to a Cervelo. There is no way I would recommend this brand to anybody. Their engineering is beyond a joke. I've never known anything like this. They're just trying to uh, get their uh, accounts in order and basically not pay out on any warranty claims. There's no way a bottom bracket manufacturer can make a bottom bracket work in the range that they've specified absolutely unacceptable to be honest there's more chance of you being able to drain the dead sea with a spoon than uh, make a bottom bracket across Cervelo's range so i wouldn't recommend you do it at all frame in terms of you know manufacturing and that sort of stuff the rest of it maybe lightweight maybe stiff whatever but compared to the tifosi frame that was on a few weeks ago that is actually better um, and it costs significantly less I mean, the top of the range R5 type of this bike is maybe three, four thousand pounds, dollars, euros, um, and it's very similar in terms of uh, the problems that you get. Now, if you enjoyed this video, please whack that like button. If you didn't, whack the dislike button. If you've got any comments, then um, use the box below to ask away. I do read all of your comments. I may not respond to them all, um, and please don't take that personally. It's just because I don't have enough time. Uh, and uh, check out my website, www.hambini.com. Um, thanks very much, and until next time.